Good evening and salam. I am Miriam Afalabi, a member of the MACFEST team. Welcome to the African Heritage Festival, celebrating African culture through literature, history, and arts. Our first event today will be exploring African Muslim heritage in Islam, which will be hosted by Karen Yot, a professor for teaching as a foreign language at the University of Education, Heidelberg, Germany. Our interests in research include intercultural learning, teaching practicums abroad, vocationally oriented language learning, classroom-based language assessments, the common European framework of reference for languages and media, and telecollaboration in the foreign language classroom. Before I hand over to Karin, I would like to request our audience to please follow MacFest on our social media and spread news about the festival using the hashtag SpreadHoney not hate. As most of our events are free, we dearly welcome donations. Thank you and over to you, Karin. Thank you so much, Mariam. Thank you for the warm welcome. And I'm very happy and honored to be here today. I would like to uh, present to you Habib Akandi, and he is a British Nigerian writer, historian, former student of, of Al Azhar University in Egypt. And he is also the author of seven books, including Illuminating the Darkness, Blacks and North America, North of, I'm sorry, Blacks and North Africans in Islam, 2012, which explores anti-Black racism and African Muslim figures in early Islamic history. And he also authored Illuminating the Blackness, Blacks and African Muslims in Brazil, uh, published in 2016. And this book explores the history of race and Islam in 19th century Brazil. And we are off to a super start with uh, Habib now. And um, I would like to give the floor to you, not without thanking you for being here tonight. And I really look forward to this fascinating event. Thank you. Hello, good evening, everyone. Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you very much, um, Professor Karen, for that wonderful introduction and for MacFest for inviting me. Um, I'm honored to be here. I will just share my screen so we can get started. Hopefully everyone can see. Yes, we can see well. Lovely. So we're on, off to a good start. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do, um, um, there's quite a lot that I would like to cover speaking about um, the, the cultural impact of Black Muslims in from Arabia to Brazil over the past two millennia. Of course, it's, it's such a long period of time. So what I've done is I'm going to split this presentation into two parts. First part, looking at anti-Black, the history of anti-Black racism in Islamic history and what were some of the reasons and causes behind that. And then I'll highlight some of the books that are written by Islamic sc scholars to address anti-Black racism and the colorism within the Muslim community. And also I'll talk about, I'll touch on a couple of um, contemporary books written by contemporary scholars and um, researchers and academics addressing this issue, which is unfortunately still an issue within many Muslim communities. And then, um, and then I'll, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Um, so during this first part of the presentation, if you have any questions, by all means, feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat box. And then hopefully I'll be able to entertain those um, at, after part one. And then we'll go into part two where I'll talk about the contributions that the African Muslims, in particular the West African Muslims, have made in Brazil. Um, and then also speaking about the legacy of African Muslims in contemporary Brazil as well as West Africa. So that's a very quick overview in terms of what we will be presenting today. Um, I'm not going to go too much into, 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 the, into, into the introduction because I think um, Professor Marin did a wonderful job. So that was a, this slide is now redundant. <laughs> um, very high level. So my book, Illuminating the Darkness, this book came out in 2012. And one of the reasons why I wrote this book is whilst I was studying in Egypt, um, after I graduated from university in 2006, um, I noticed there was a number of anti-Black sentiment that I came across in a number of Islamic texts written by prominent Muslim scholars, and which, you know, took, which I was quite shocked by. Um, and even unfortunately, months, although I had a wonderful time in Egypt and it's a beautiful country, and the people are very hospitable, I did notice there was a, amongst even young people as well as adults, there was kind of a disdain shown towards um, people of a darker skin, skin complexion. 
whether they were um, Egyptians from the south or whether they were, you know, black Africans from other part of the continent. And again, this was something that I did notice during my time there, so much so that even sometimes when myself or some of my friends who are, who are black as well would walk the streets, um, we was, you know, sometimes abused by called Chocolate Boy, Ya Chocolata, um, Abu Aswad, meaning the father of darkness. Um, people will say things like, they'll ask us to look at our time. They'll say, come sal in Arabic, meaning what time is it? Then when you look at your hand, they will start laughing and giggling. Now, at the time, I didn't understand why they were doing this. And when I asked a couple of uh, my Egyptian friends and they were speaking about, they said that it's, it's a way of mocking Black people that they'll ask you what time it is. So when you look at your hand, then you're reminded of your Blackness because they saw being dark in complexion, being Black to be something that was um, disdainful um, and derogatory. So again, this was something that, again, like I said, it took me, I was quite shocked and surprised by because obviously as a Muslim, and I know that there's no such thing as racism or Islam teaches racial equality. Um, so that's why I was surprised that a number of my other Muslim brothers and sisters held these um, anti-Black sentiment. And then, like I said, coupled by the anti-Black racism um, that I saw in a number of Islamic texts dating back to the ninth century, that was one of the catalysts, you can say, for me to um, write my first book, Illuminating the Darkness, where I wanted to address the issue of anti-Black racism in classic Islamic texts and also try and understand what were the reasons and rationale behind some of these you know, well-regarded scholars saying such disdainful things about Black people, um, whether it's in relation to slavery, whether it's in relation to interracial marriages and some scholars discouraging um, Arabs or other Muslims from marrying um, black women or black men. Um, and then I also came across a number of traditional scholars dating back to the ninth century who wrote some great work speaking about the positive contributions that black people have made in history, which I'll touch on a little bit later. So again, th this was kind of like the, as the inspiration for me to write, write this book where I wanted to first and foremost explain and argue that from an Islamic or perspective, like that the religion is free of racism unfortunately there does exist anti-black sentiment in a number of islamic texts whether it's by um muslim historians um whether it's by islamic jurists um it does exist and that, that that does have to be addressed but then also i wanted to kind of address and highlight some of the great medieval scholars um from the ninth century up until the 16th century in the common era and i'll highlight a couple of these scholars who wrote a number of books to counteract this narrative that black that blackness is somewhat less than an inferior um, than someone who's in a, or a fairer skin complexion or, or, or than whiteness. So um, I wanted to touch on that and also examine um, how Islam and Muslim um, societies, pre-modern societies, viewed race and skin colour. Um, and then I also want to supplement that, this book by having um, another section just looking at some very brief biographies of black and African prophets companions of the prophet Muhammad as well as righteous figures in history because ultimately the main aim of the book like I said was to first highlight the contributions that black and African Muslims, Muslims both men and women have made in history and also um, explain the difference between Islam as a religion which is free of anti-black racism and unfortunately some of the practices that does exist in some Muslim communities in history where anti-black racism is an issue. Um, and then after I wrote this book in 2012, um, I then followed, this is actually my fourth book, where I followed up my first book with another book called Illuminating the Blackness, which explores um, Black people and African Muslims in Brazil. I am originally from Nigeria, obviously born and bred in the UK, um, but I'm originally from the Yoruba ethnic group. And another thing that did, I, I did notice whilst I was in Egypt is that very rarely did I hear about the contributions um, that Africans, especially West African Muslims, have made in history. Um, and I did attend a Pan-Africanist Saturday school when I was in before my teens, and I was aware of the presence of West African Muslims in Brazil um, from before before the Europeans so-called discovered Brazil, and also during the, and so, and also during the um, the, tra the transatlantic slave um, period where up to 30% of the enslaved Africans were said to be Muslim, and a number of them, especially those that arrived in Brazil, um, were of Nigerian heritage. And a number of these Muslims led the number of slave revolts, which I'll talk a little bit about in the second part of, of this presentation. So I wanted to kind of write a book to kind of summarize 
um, these slave revolts and slave revolts and the cultural impact that these Nigerian Muslims have made, um, not only in Brazil, but also in West Africa, because a number of them traveled back to Africa. And there's a number of fascinating stories that hopefully I'll be able to kind of um, retell in, in, in the second part. So these two books, Illuminating the Darkness, Illuminating the Blackness, that's like you can say the basis of um, today's presentation. A lot of what I'm going to be covering are going to be covered in these, in these two books. Um, but very high level in terms of, again, especially for those who are not familiar with obviously the religion of Islam and what Islam says about race and blackness, I just wanted to kind of very quickly highlight obviously what is, is Islam because some people are not maybe as familiar as one would have thought about the religion. So Islam is a, is a monotheistic religion um, brought by the Prophet Muhammad in 7th century Arabia, which ultimately teaches the belief that there's only one God and that Muhammad is the messenger of, of God. And people who believe in the religion are called Muslims. And, and like I mentioned previously, the Quran does preach racial equality, stating that the variety of human skin colors reflect the one creator. So again, from an Islamic or religious perspective, racism doesn't exist or should not exist. That doesn't mean that racism doesn't exist amongst some Muslims. So it's important that people differentiate to, between the two because although there's racism in Islamic history, it doesn't mean there's racism in terms of what the religion teaches or advocates or preaches. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that. And even during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, there was examples of cut of skin color discrimination, um, color prejudice, racial prejudice, um, or anti, and anti-blackness, which he did um, strive to fight against. So that's, again, I just wanted to make sure that's kind of clarified that I'm, when I'm speaking about Islam as a religion, which is anti-black, that's clear cut. Um, but where there's a lot of resistance, even amongst a number of Muslims, is this idea that racism exists within um, Muslim communities. And some Muslims, I think now it's changed because even when I wrote my book in 2012, this was before um, the Black Lives Matter movement. This was before um, a number of Muslims were comfortable to speak, to address this, this taboo topic. Um, whereas, like I said, when I wrote the book, um, even when I was traveling to different parts of, of the UK to deliver uh, presentations, there was a bit of resistance that I felt even amongst some Muslim communities and even some Muslim leaders um, because they felt that I was disparaging the religion or trying to cause division when in reality I'm trying to highlight a problem which exists in Muslim communities. It doesn't mean I'm casting aspersion against the religions. So I just kind of wanted to kind of address that because it's a, it's, it's a, it is a historic reality that we can't deny. Um, and that being said, um, there are key, um, if I were to talk about some key themes or key points in, in Islamic history of examples of anti-blackness, um, first and foremost, I would, I would, talk, I was, I would, um, I would say the oppression of East African slaves in 19th century Baghdad in Iraq, which led to one of the famous um, slave uprisings outside of the Americas, a slave re and rebellion or revolt known as the Zanj Revolt. So the, the Zanj are what we would say are modern people who, are, who live in modern day Ethiopia, Eritrea, basically the Horn of Africa. Now a number of, a number of East Africans and a number of them were Muslims. They were enslaved by other Muslims, by, predominantly by Arabs um, and transported to Iraq and they were harshly treated. Now this led to um, a number of slave revolts, like I mentioned, which is known as the Zanj revolt, which lasted over up to maybe 20 years, where they were fighting against, again, this a wrongful enslavement and the persecution that they suffered. Now, as a result of this, as a, as a, as a result of this revolt, what happened is that a number of um, people in the community, and these were Muslims, they started fabricated traditions or fabricated hadiths um, which are basically sayings attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, saying disparaging remarks about black people. So there were some hadiths, and these hadiths still exist in Islamic texts. And these were some of the, 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 the anti-black sentiment that I found when I was initially studying in Egypt, which horrified me. So there was a number of like texts and sayings, for example, that one that says there is no good in a black person. When he's satiated, he fornicates, and when he's hungry, he steals. So this idea that, you know, the stereotypical idea that black people are promiscuous or they're thieves or they're less intelligent than other people. This was something that, again, and this is this predates the contact of Arabs and Muslims with the Western world. So oftentimes as Muslims, 
Muslims would like to blame like the racism that exists in contemporary society on the West and, um, you know, with the Europeans inventing racism and things like that in the 19th century when this predates Western racism or European racism. So it, I know this may be new to a number of people and it's uncomfortable hearing, but this is a reality that anti-Blackness did exist in Muslim communities as far back as, like I said, the ninth century. So much so where, unfortunately, you did have a number of Muslim scholars, um, well-renowned and prominent scholars, um, such as Ibn, um, Ibn Khaldun, who's a famous historian, who in his book, um, Al-Muqaddima, he spoke about Blacks being like naturally slaves and inferior to Arabs and other people, and they're considered to be less intelligent. And also, um, the Curse of Ham story, for those of you who are not familiar, there is a story in the Bible, um, in Genesis, where I'm just going to summarize where it is said in the Bible that Prophet Noah, he cursed he, one of his son's descendants and said that they'll be enslaved and they'll be servants for the other brothers. And this became known as the Curse of Ham or Curse of Canaan story, because Canaan was the son of Ham in the, in the biblical tradition. Now, when this tradition was translated and transmitted to a number of Muslims, um, and this is again, this was around the ninth century, this is after the time of the Prophet Muhammad, um, a number of Muslim scholars, when they relay this story, they, there were some additions to this story where they were saying that Noah cursed Ham and his descendants with blackness. And as a result of this curse, they Ham and his sons became black. So that's so this kind of contributes to the idea that black people are considered to be inferior, less than um, you know, less than than human than real human beings, so to speak. So again, these were some of the troubling things, which again, unfortunately, I did come across, but it, it gave me an, an appreciation in the sense of understanding how we got to where we are today, where this rhetoric, which unfortunately, this anti-black rhetoric, which it does exist in some Muslim communities and, and, and among some Muslim scholars where they got this from, because some of the Muslims at the time, um, particularly from the ninth, 10th century, they tried to rationalize some of these theories, although they came from non-Islamic sources, they didn't come from the Quran or from traditions from the Prophet Muhammad, but they tried to rationalize it because the ancient Greeks were seen to be very intelligent, you know, in, in, the, the master of intellect. So they tried to rationalize some of these theories and they incorporated them into some of in some Islamic texts, whether they're historic texts, whether they are texts about Islamic jurisprudence to kind of explain some of the issues that they were facing, like the Zand revolt and why black people maybe were behaving a certain way. Um, and again, a couple of other examples of anti-black sentiment that I came across in, which does still exist, unfortunately, in some Islamic legal texts is where, um, and this is something that even unfortunately you do have some Muslims today will continue to, to talk about that black people or black women are considered to be less desirable marital partners compared to fair skinned um, women, whether they're Arab or, or European. So um, a man should not marry a black woman or the idea of, of the hypersexuality of the black man, that black men, black men will consider to be hypersexual and promiscuous and have this insatiable lust and so because of that, even during the Ottoman period, like from around the 15th, 16th century, a number of black men were castrated where, excuse me for being you know, explicit, their genitalia was cut off. And the reason why they, they did this was because a number of the Ottoman leaders at the time, like I mentioned, they feared the hypersexuality or the perceived hypersexuality of black men. And they wanted these black men to be the guards of their wives and their concubines, but they didn't want these men to have relations with with their with the women in, in, that was in the domain, so that's what, and this led to um, a, a large number of works, even that's still published today, about the Enochs, which are the the, the castrated um, guards of the Ottoman era. So again, and, and a lot of these mistreatment that was dealt and shown towards black people was because of some of these views, these anti-black views um, that were either that either came from the ancient Greek theory about the natural about black people being naturally slaves. The curse of ham story that was changed to to be this idea that black people are cursed with blackness and also like i mentioned the um the fabricated hadiths that came out as a result of the zand revolt now because of again a lot of this anti-black sentiment and again i'm i'm summarizing maybe like six seven hundred eight hundred years but i just wanted to highlight some of these key 
um, issues so you can kind of understand what the framework in terms of this was even amongst the ingen- um, intelligentsia. So it wasn't just like amongst people you could say who were less educated or less informed, even some of the so-called intellectuals and the elites held these views that black people were seen as, as, as inferior to, to, to Arabs and to Europeans. Now, in response to this anti-blackness, there did there was a number of you know Muslim scholars who wanted to address um, this negative representation of black people because a it wasn't from the religion of Islam, and it was something that again that was not something that they agreed with. Um, but I would summarize the approaches of of medieval scholars into two two camps. One was what you could call the resistance model, and this is where you could say it was like an unapologetic approach. Where, they, where the people celebrated the achievements of black people in history and their virtues and their compl- accomplishments. And they eulogized and, and, and spoke in, in high praise of the beauty of black women. This is like, you could say the resistance model, where like I said, unapologetic. Then another model, which was quite common, which is probably even more common, unfortunately, is what I would call the internalizing contempt model. And this is where you could say it's like a backhanded compliment where Although, although some of these scholars, these poets, these figures were trying to defend black people, they accepted the perceived, perceived negativity of blackness and the so-called undesirability of dark skin, but they wanted to assert the moral and intellectual qualities of black people. So what does that mean? An example is like if someone were to say such and such person is smart for a black person, as if this person is smart despite his blackness, or even though he's black, he has got a bit of intelligence or such and such woman is pretty for a dark skinned girl or a dark skinned woman. So this idea that dark skin in and of itself is not desirable, but despite her darkness, despite her blackness, she is a pretty person. And again, this is like a backhanded compliment. So like I said, and this, and unfortunately these two examples, you do kind of even still see them today when people are trying to address like this, um, the anti-blackness which exists in Islamic history where it's either one of it's a very unapologetic and um, the resistance model, shall we say, and then the second is one of the internalizing contempt model, which I will kind of summarize and say is, is more of like a backhanded compliment. Now, some of some prominent scholars who um, I, I kind of want to highlight who spoke about this topic, one was Ibn al-Jahid, uh, one was al-Jahid, who was a Afro-Arab scholar from the ninth century in Iraq, and he wrote, and again, this was during the period of the Zand Rebellion, which I mentioned earlier. So he was around when he saw not only the oppression of the, in, of the enslaved of East Africans, but also the response of a number, of number of the Arab Muslims who were saying, you know, dis, the, demeaning things about Black people and fabricating traditions. So he wrote a number, and he was a prolific writer. He wrote many books, and he wanted to write a book to speak about the virtues and accomplishments of Black people. And he was a bit of a... Um, he was a satirist as well so he did include a lot of humor in his work um, but he was very defiant and he was someone that i would argue that he he fitted into the resistance model and one of his famous books that he wrote addressing anti-black racism in the muslim community is a book um which has been translated into english called the glory of the black race or and it's, it's also been translated as the superiority of black people over white people now even in his book, he wasn't arguing, he wasn't a black supremacist, he wasn't arguing that black people are superior to white people, he was counteracting the argument, or he's addressing the, like I said, the widespread view that black people are seen as less than to the Arabs, so he wanted to, like I said, raise the awareness and speak about the accomplishments that black people have made in history and celebrate the beauties of black women, and that was in the ninth century. For, there, there was other scholars who, again, who wrote other similar works, but I just want to highlight the notable ones, Fast forward, you know, a few hundred years later, another scholar again from Iraq, but this, well, this particular scholar was not um, of African descent like Al-Jahid. So a scholar by the name of um, Abdurrahman ibn Al-Jawzi. So he was from Iraq and he was a prominent um, theologian, jurist, um, and as well as historian. He wrote a book, um, which the English translation is Illuminating the Darkness Regarding the Virtues of Blacks and Abyssinians. Abyssinians referring to the people of contemporary um, East Africa, like the Horn of Africa. So, he, in, and he mentioned in his introduction, the reason why he wrote his book was because he noticed um, a number of Muslims, black Muslims came to him and they felt that God, Allah had cursed them because of, dark, because of their darkness of skin. So he wanted to write a book to address that A, in Islam, you know, 
God doesn't judge someone by the by the way by their form or their physical appearance or their skin color, but it's by um, their their faith and their good deeds. So color doesn't come into the criteria in terms of measuring how good or bad of a person is in the eyes of God in terms of from the religious perspective. And then also because again a number of them had like an inferiority complex, he wanted to write a book and he mentioned this like I said in the introduction to celebrate the virtues and accomplishments of black men and women in history. And that's um, and that was basically what the, his book um, Illuminating Darkness was about. And obviously that book was crucial see, for me writing my book. And that's why paying homage to Ibn al Jose and others, um, that's why I named my book Illuminating the Darkness as well. So that was in the 13th century, so not the 15th century. Fast forward another 300 years, you still had a number of scholars, again, writing books about um, addressing the anti-blackness that was prevalent in the Muslim community. Another notable scholar was Ibn um, was Al Asiyuti, who was um, originally of Persian descent, but he was born and raised in Egypt. He wasn't a black scholar, but he also wanted to address the anti-black sentiment that was prevalent, unfortunately, in the Muslim communities as well as even amongst Muslim scholars. So he wrote he, wrote, he actually wrote three books celebrating the accomplishments and achievements of black people. So and and uh, one of his books has been. Um, translated or partially translated into English, um, which is called The Spirits of Black Folk. So these are, again, these are examples of, you could say, scholars, medieval scholars writing about um, addressing anti-Black racism in the Muslim community and then highlighting the contributions that um, Black people have made in, in history. And again, this all predates contact with, with, with Westerners, with, with, with Europe, because oftentimes, like I mentioned before, Muslims like to blame or attribute the racism which is prevalent in this world to, to Europeans or to, or, or to Westerners when there was a racism or at least colorism did exist and um, which predates contact with, 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 with Westerners. Um, and then since then, again, there's some contemporary books that's been written by, like I mentioned before, um, contemporary scholars, researchers and what have you, who again were trying to address this issue of anti-Blackness within the Muslim community and celebrating the contributions that black people have made both in pre-modern and contemporary history and I'm, again i'm not going to go through each of them but again just for anyone who is interested in, in this topic and learning more about black muslim history um you have deeper roots by um um dr abdullah um abdullah hakim quick um centering the narrative um by ahmed mubarak and, and dawood walid that came out a few years ago the negro in, in afro Arabian Muslim Consciousness by Abdullah um, Ali and Beyond Bilal by Mustafa Briggs came out I think a bit early this year. Islam and Blackness by Jonathan A.C. Brown that is due to come out um, in November this year. The Autobiography of, of Malcolm X. Um, the African Caliph Caliphate by Ibrahim Suleiman. Um, Slave and Rebellion which is a phenomenal book um, about the, the slave revolts which took place in Brazil which I'll touch on in, in the second part of this presentation by um, João Jose Hayes from Brazil. Um, and then again, some more, more books, if anyone's interested to, to know more about the contributions and, and that black people made in history. Um, Beyond Timbuktu, Servants of Allah, um, Black Crescent, African Muslims in Antebellum America. Um, so uh, The Call of Bilal, Educating Muslim Women, which is a great book about the legacy, the life and legacy of Nana Asmao, who was um, a sister of a prominent West African leader, um, Uthman Don Fodio, and she was a poet, she was um, a scholar, she was an intellectual. So that's it. and she set up a number of um, of schools in in West in contemporary um, Nigeria. So that's a really great book about her life and legacy, and Islam and the Black American by Sherman uh, A. Jackson, The Walk in the Quran, a really good book, a fascinating book exploring the scholastic and intellectual tradition of West African Muslims um, as far back as like the 16th, 17th century and um, Muslim call by Su'ad um, Abdul Kabir. So again, yeah, that's again some further resources if anyone's interested. Um, I think we're coming to the end. We have set the half hour mark. So if anyone has, I'll probably hand over to Professor Karen if anyone has any questions that I've, I'm happy to entertain. Um, if not, I'll, I'll start part two. Yeah, thank you so far, Habib. Thanks, thank you so much for illuminating us and broadening our horizons, literally speaking. Um, 
yeah, it was, it's been fascinating to learn more about Black Muslim history. And I would like to invite people to ask questions. The F&A uh, section is still empty. Uh, you don't have to type in if you don't want to. You can also, I think you can also unmute yourself or use the chat box if you want. Kashaf says, I have no questions, but I just wanted to say thank you for part one. Thanks very much. Muhammad uh, Amin says, uh, he's just bought the book, Blacks in North African in Islam. <clears throat> and um, if nobody would like to ask, I would actually have one, if I may. <laughs> um, I would like to know, um, you've got the, teaching of, uh, the teachings of Islam and you um, said there the practices of Muslims uh, were a bit different. Um, how do you explain that? You saying that there is a sharp contrast sometimes between the teachings of Islam and the practices of Muslims. Yes, most definitely. And I think, uh, and the reason why um, I, I like to highlight that and explain that is because oftentimes people use Islam and Muslim interchangeably and they're two very different. So Islam as a religion says one thing. Now, Muslims obviously are those people who believe in Islam, but not necessarily all of their behavior reflects Islamic teachings. The same way, um, because, and again, and the reason why there, there, there seems to be a resistance amongst Muslims to address like such topics because they feel a it's someone maybe like I mentioned disparaging the religion but it's not disparaging the religion it's speaking about a reality which does exist maybe in the Muslim community the same way Islam teaches men that they should treat their wives well it doesn't mean because Islam says as a religion it doesn't mean that all Muslims treat their wives well and that domestic violence doesn't exist it does exist so if it exists it's a Muslim problem it's not a religious problem so people need to understand the difference between what the religion teaches and the practices of, unfortunately, maybe some religious people which go against the religion. And that's something that, um, like I said, because oftentimes people use the two terms interchangeably, or when we speak about Islamic history, people assume that if things were tolerated or happened in Islamic history, that reflects what the religion teaches. And that's not the case. So that's why for me, it's, it's again, it's, it's the way... Like, for example, if someone were to say Christianity um, permits the enslavement of Black people, encouraged the enslavement of Black people because some Christians said that was okay, it doesn't necessarily mean that that reflects the religion. So that's doing a disservice. And that's also, that's also like an accusation that's often put forth, even by some Muslims, towards Christians or Christianity, that because some Christians in a particular period of time advocated or permitted the, the transatlantic slave trade, then they will say that Christianity as a religion supported the transatlantic slave trade. So that's why I'm not saying there's a, there's a difference between the two. And again, from a religion, from Islam, so Muslims obviously traditionally believe that the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, that they speak on behalf of Islam. So even if someone is educated, a scholar, they can't say, oh, this is what I believe. So I'm I'm like the representative of God for Muslims around the world. No, it, it doesn't. We don't, we don't have like a clergy system. So because of that, even if a Muslim scholar says something, a Muslim scholar may say something that goes against the religion. He's not infallible or she's not infallible. Now, if someone understands that, then they can understand, oh, there can be abuses of power even amongst those who are educated, those who are more well-informed or people can make mistakes and it, but it has to be corrected and addressed but because there's a reluctance to accept this idea that someone who is educated someone who's knowledgeable can say something or do something un-islamic 
people often turn the blind eye. So that's why, again, I always wait both with, I'm always explain, trying to reiterate there's a difference between Islam as a religion and the practices sometimes of Muslims. It doesn't always align with one another, even though it should do. Thank you so much for clarifying this. Thank you. Jennifer M says, thank you, thanks for this presentation. Important research and information, but disturbing. Yeah, some of it certainly is. And uh, Channel Nada uh, uh, congratulates you on your presentation, Habib. Please share with us, she says, she asks, uh, please share with us, who was your first inspiration? Also, what is your responsibility as a writer for a new generation, especially in schools? Wow, that's a, that's a very good question. That's a huge question. Um, so my first, I've got a number of inspirations. I wouldn't say there's one particular person or one event in my life, but one thing um, I think is important is to leave a legacy, to leave a contribution that people hopefully can benefit from whether when I'm here or whenever I leave this world. So that is one of the, inspirations maybe for me to write and for me I write about things that I'm passionate about like I'm not a full-time academic I'm not a full-time researcher I've got like I'm actually a chartered accountant by profession this is the books I write is just like passion projects it's just things that I'm passionate about and I know it might not sound like it but I don't like talking a lot so I prefer to put things that maybe that like interest me in paper in the form of a book and whoever wants to benefit from them they can whether it's like I said whether, when I'm alive or when I leave this world and I just believe, in, even from a religious perspective, that if you're doing something beneficial and people benefit from it, then ultimately God hopefully will, will, will reward that person. So um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily an individual as such that inspires me, because there's a number of inspiration I do have. But I am actually particular. I, I, if there were a number of the early Muslim scholars, to be fair, actually they did inspire me, like um, Al Jahid, um, Al Suyuti, and Ibn Al Jawzi, because they were speaking about social issues they wasn't just speaking about theoretical issues they were speaking about issues that like i said anti-black racism they were speaking about the oppression of women and women's rights they were speaking about female sexuality so they were speaking about what maybe some people consider to be taboo but they were important they were speaking about marginalized people because that's ultimately what the religion encourages so it was it was those type of it was those types of figures actually when i think about all like malcolm x that maybe kind of inspires me because I think, um, I think as well. So the pen is is mightier than than sometimes a spoken word, um, and because it can last for a longer period of time, um, and and you can reach more people. And another thing is that I think because some of these stories aren't being told, rather than complain about it, because I used to always complain why is it that we don't hear about the history and the contributions of Black people, West Africans, being of someone who's of West African descent. The fact that I traveled to Egypt, I was fortunate enough to learn Arabic. I came into contact with some of these books in Arabic. So I had access. I had, I had no excuse. And hopefully my, some of my works can inspire people to write their own stories and write their own history. And one of the unfortunate, and I'm sure probably people have noticed from the, the books I've shown, um, the resources, one of my... Um, disappointment is that most of these books are written by men so that's another thing I think of failing unfortunately that we don't hear much about the contributions or the perspectives of, of women especially in pre-modern times but hopefully um maybe some of what I'm doing and to highlight the works of 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 women in particular that can inspire and even if they go disagree with me that can also be a source of inspiration that this guy doesn't know what he's talking about he he forgot about such and such people or he forgot about, forgot about such and such stories that might be a source of inspiration for someone to spark someone to kind of write their own book or or do a presentation and things like that so um and so the second part of the, the question um was, terms, what is your responsibility as a writer for a new generation especially in schools um this might be a not a a politically correct answer but i don't think about my responsibility a because i don't I don't teach in schools so a lot of my work is for adults it's not to say that children or people in schools cannot benefit but I mainly just focus on people over the age of I would say 21 but I do sometimes teach some universities like as a guest lecturer 
um, because they're able to handle, I think they're able to handle that information themselves. Um, if I think about the responsibility, if anything, my responsibility is try and provide accurate information. But if I think so much about the responsibility in the sense of maybe um, the impact, the negative impact some of what I'm presenting may have on people, I might not write anything or present anything. That's why I don't try and think too much about it. I just think about my responsibility is to try and provide accurate and informative information and in a way that is easy for people to take and understand. But um, I don't look at it like it's... Um, I have to like, because I can't speak on behalf of black people. I can't speak on behalf of Muslims. I'm just someone who's, who speaks on what I'm passionate about. Whoever wants to benefit from it, they can, or wants to be inspired by it, they can. But yes, so it's a very good question. But um, yeah, I, I don't think about my, I don't know if that's me being irresponsible, <laughs> but I, I don't really think about my, uh, my responsibility too much as, 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 as a writer, apart from trying to make sure that the message that I'm giving is fair it's accurate um, and it's on, and I'm being honest to myself. Thank you. Are there any other questions? The F and the F and A is still empty, and you've got your chance now maybe to use the chat box if you would like to ask another question. Uh, let's just wait for another couple of seconds, and then. If there are no more questions, you can maybe proceed to the second part of the presentation. Now is your chance to ask questions. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> we'll have a second part. So if anyone has any questions, then I can I'll start part two, then I'm I'm happy to um, ask any other questions you've got in relation to part one. But I just want to go to part two. Before going into part two, because part two is mainly going to be about, it's predominantly about Brazil, I just want to touch on, so I spoke a little bit about, obviously, my first book, Illuminating the Darkness. A couple of things that I want to add, which I did discuss and um, explore in, in Illuminating the Blackness. So, like I mentioned, I am of West African descent, originally from, um, from Nigeria. And like I mentioned, when I was between, like, between nine and ten, I went, I went to... Um, a pan-Africanist school where they taught us about black history and and also about the Brazilians, I mean the Nigerians in Brazil. And being a um a big Michael Jackson fan, uh, I'm sure people are or those of you who are who are, are familiar with the song They Don't Care About Us. So if you remember that music video um where Michael Jackson was wearing a shirt, um we had the word Olodum emblazed on his shirt. I'm not sure if you I think I've got a picture but I can quickly show you. Um, yeah, so this also sparks my curiosity. So that word Olodum, it's from a Nigerian word meaning from um, Odumare, meaning the one God. And this is in Bahia, in northeastern Brazil. And this is the place where, where he filmed even this music video was where a number of enslaved Africans was transported to um, in 19th century Brazil. And this is also the place where there were a number of slave rebellions. Now that group is an Afro-Brazilian um, not only carnival and music group, but they also speak about anti-black racism and, and things like that. And even the name was inspired by um, the enslaved Africans, a number of them being African Muslims, which I'll talk about. But that sparks my curiosity, even from a relatively young age, before I was a teenager, to know more about Brazil and the connection between Brazil and Nigeria in particular. So I just kind of wanted to touch on that. And then also... Um, around, I think it was 2013, I believe, 13 or 14, I went to Brazil for the carnival. And whilst I was there, a number of people in Rio de Janeiro, a number of people asked me, was I from Bahia in Northeastern Brazil? Because they said, you've got strong features of someone from Bahia. And I said, no, I'm not. But then when I went to visit later on in the end, in November, I felt like I was in, in Nigeria because a lot of the, the cuisine is very similar to West Africa. So they have a dish which is very similar to what um, Nigerians eat. Um, a number of the dresses um, and even the music and even um, the music and even, even um, some people even in Brazil today speak Yoruba, like the native language, one of the native language of Nigeria. And again, that sparks my curiosity to kind of understand more about the, not only the history of the West African 
Muslims in Brazil, but also the, the cultural impact that those West Africans had and still have in contemporary Brazil um, and, and parts of West Africa. So that was that sparked my curiosity to write this book, Illuminating the Blackness. So I wanted to not only, like I said, delve into the history of the Muslims in Brazil, but also um, what does race and blackness and colorism mean in Brazil? Because their understandings of, of race and skin color is very different to, you can say, American understanding of black. So in America, we have this idea of the one drop rule, where if you have um, like a trace of blackness, shall we say, or black parents, then that person will be considered to be black, even if the other parent is of a different um, ethnicity. Whereas in Brazil, what I was fascinated by is that they viewed race more in a, in a way that was more descriptive, as in they will describe people by so many different skin complexions, chocolate, mahogany, depending on how that person necessarily looked. So they didn't have this idea that blackness was anyone that kind of like had a, um, a, that was a descendant of someone from Africa. So again, that is just a different way of looking at race. Um, and yes, anti-black racism does exist, unfortunately, in Brazil, but things like interracial relationships were very, is very common. Um, and they're more embracing of, especially in Northeastern Brazil, of African culture. Um, but whilst I was there, I didn't see or hear too much about the contributions of the Malays, which I'm going to talk about, which are the, East, are, are the West African Muslims. So that's, that's also kind of like what spurred me to write this book, which came out in 2016. And I was actually working on a documentary with um, a couple of outlets to kind of get it off the ground. But I've been saying that for the last five, six years, and it still hasn't come out. But in summary, what Illuminating the Blackness is, is about in terms of the, the second part, looking at the African Muslims in Brazil, not many people know, but the predecessor of Mansa Musa, so Mansa Musa was a 14th century emperor of Mali um, who, who made a famous pilgrimage to Mecca. And he's also featured this, a couple of maps that were um, from some European to like the 14th century showing Mansa Musa. This is Mansa Musa here and he's great wealth and he was known to be a very generous man but people don't know that his predecessor called Mansa Abu Bakari II, Mansa meaning like king or emperor, he actually traveled to the Americas in the 14th century and there are again a historic reports that show that that found traces of the like their, their gold that they that was from West Africa in in in, in parts of Brazil in in um, northeast Africa northeast Brazil sorry and there's also some inscriptions in Brazil indicating the Mandinka Muslim presence. Now, Mandinka is an ethnic group in contemporary West Africa and around the Mali era where Mansa Musa and his predecessor, Mansa Abu Bakari II. Um, so again, this was something that I was fascinated by. Again, I don't want to go into too much detail, but this idea that even like Europeans discovered the Americas or Brazil, that's also been debunked by a number of historians who have mentioned that and even a number of the Europeans like um, Columbus and others who when they went to um, America they saw up they saw not only the natives but also they saw black Africans in 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 America there as well so I kind of wanted to touch on that and then also I wanted to kind of speak about which I don't think gets enough co coverage is the intellectual heritage of African Muslims in Brazil um, so when and I will touch a little bit about the the, the the slave revolts which took place in 19th century Brazil but not many people know that a number of the enslaved Africans that were transported to Brazil, a number of those people were educated, um, erudite scholars of Islam, and they continued to practice their faith whilst they were even in enslavement in Brazil. And a number of the Brazilian authorities also documented that and spoke about that. There was something different about, they, they referred to the West African Muslims as Nagos. There was something different about these type of slaves, I will say, because they would pray, they were very, um, you know, religious, they wouldn't eat certain things, probably referring to pork, they didn't drink wine, um, and they were very studious, and they used to have amulets and writings of the Quran, and these are two examples of, um, of parchments and, and writings from the West African Muslims of, of, of verses of the Quran, and there were also some secret Quran schools in 19th century Rio de Janeiro, and a number of these enslaved Africans primarily from Yoruba and Hausa, which is um, two major ethnic groups in contemporary Nigeria, they led a number of slave revolts. Um, now, one of these slave revolts was um, 
was the slave revolt in 1835, but there were several slave revolts between 1807 and 1835, particularly in the state of Bahia, which is in northeastern Brazil, and in Salvador, which is which was the first capital city of Brazil. And that's where, like I said, even today in, in Salvador, 80% of the people in um 80% of the people in, in, in Salvador are of eight or of African descent. And you can visibly see like the African presence presence even even till today. Like it's very, very, very Afri African. And um a number like especially when we're speaking about the 1835 slave revolt, which is the largest slave revolt in the Americas, in although it's known as a slave revolt, it did consist of free black people as well, but it was predominantly led by, like I said, um enslaved um men. Um, predominantly from the Yoruba or Hausa ethnic group. Um, and it was inspired by Muslim teachers and scholars. And but unfortunately, um, it was quashed before it um before it really they really could lead that slave revolt because there was an informer within the 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 whether it was the Muslims or the or the or the enslaved people is it's not clear, but there was an informer who and, and told the authorities and they basically they um prosecuted the um the, the rebels and a number of them were deported some were killed some were imprisoned um but and they and they found out when they were doing a lot of these interrogations about some of their plans behind obviously doing this this slave revolt and they actually did this slave revolt on the 25th of, of ramadan which is the night of prayer it's like a, a it's, it's known as the light of qadr which is a night of prayer from an, in, in islam which is like a very sacred night um, and they were writing verses from the Quran about this particular, this particular, this particular um, day. Now, in terms of what the aftermath, like I said, a number of these rebels were arrested and some were sentenced to death. Others were deported back to West Africa. And I'll talk a little bit about those Afro-Brazilian returnees later in their cultural impact. Um, and I mentioned some of the amulets and the Quranic writings that were found by the Brazilian authorities. But what this slave revolt did, or none of these slave revolts, especially the 1835 one, it led to widespread hysteria amongst a number of the Brazilian authorities because they feared that would be further uprising from other black people, other than enslaved black people. So what they were worried about is that they wanted to quell this slave revolt because they didn't want there to be a knock-on effect. Um, but it, fortunately there was, and there was other slave revolts that did kind of take place. And within like 30 to 40 years of this slave revolt, Slave, slavery was soon abolished in 1888 in Brazil. Um, I just wanted to show some images of, of African Muslims in Brazil. So these are some paintings that were taken by a French artist um, who traveled to Brazil in the late 19th century. And you can see on the left-hand side here, this is a, a visibly Muslim woman wearing the hijab, the Muslim veil or the Islamic veil. You have someone that's clearly dressed in an Arab, like Islam, you could say garb, um, someone who, some Muslims as well, who are, who's receiving cupping, who is, which is a very common um, practice amongst, um, amongst Muslims. And then you hear you've got, uh, a, well, clearly what appears to be a Muslim man who's wearing a hat known as a taqiyya, which is very popular amongst um, West African Muslims, that style. So these are like examples, visible examples of, of, African Muslims in 19th century Brazil. And then here again, this is an example of a Muslim man. You can tell by his, his garb and his hat. Like the, the Muslims of the, at that time, they also, they, their clothing was very distinctive from, from the non-Muslim um, enslaved people. And then here, this is in Alagoas in Northeastern Brazil. And these are, again, you can see, hopefully you can see, but these is like a, woman, a Muslim woman wearing a hijab. And these are other um, Muslims in, in Brazil. Some of them was enslaved and some of them were free. So this is like, you know, clearly this is a, a visible presence of Muslims in Brazil, which again, unfortunately, we don't really hear much about, even a number of Brazilians are not taught about this in their schooling system. And I mentioned a number of the Brazilians that were, after the um, slave revolts that were um, transported back to West Africa. Now, a number of these Afro-Brazilian returnees, um, a number of them, they built their own separate communities in Sierra Leone, some in Ghana, some in Nigeria, and they had a distinctive personality and community because although they were West African, because obviously they had, some of them were born and raised and spent a considerable amount of time in Brazil. They were, you could say culturally different to the West Africans in the, their respective countries because some of them were maybe originally from Nigeria that was transported to Brazil. 
stayed in Brazil for a period of time, then now they were transported back to maybe Sierra Leone or some to Ghana. Now, the Afro-Brazilian returnees in Nigeria are known, are known as the Ajudas, and this is an example of a Brazilian mosque in Nigeria today. Um, whereas Afro-Brazilian returnees in Sierra Leone, which is another country in West Africa, they're known as the Saro people. And the Afro-Brazilian returnees in Ghana, they're known as the Tabon people. So these, and they, even till today, they've kind of maintained their distinctive um, Afro-Brazilian culture in, in contemporary West Africa. And also just another example of the cultural impact that West Africans, I mean, that Afro-Brazilians, particularly the Muslims had in Africa today. This is a famous, you could say, Brazilian mosque um, known as the Shita Bay Mosque. Um, that was, I think it was established in 1892 or 1894. I think it was 1894 officially. But this was the inauguration um, by Muhammad Shita. So that's him here. Um, and a number of distinguished um, personalities, both Muslim traditionalists and Christians as well, um, who, who came to attend um, this, the inauguration, this opening of this mosque. And the style of this mosque is in the form of what is known as the Baroque style, which it, it was a Brazilian architect who designed this style. And it's very similar to the style of the church of the churches in Brazil around that period in the 19th century. So that's why it's a very even it's still standing today because this is like a contemporary picture, but it's a very distinctive like Brazilian style. So this is like an example of the cultural influence and impact of like Brazilians in West Africa um, with this with the Shita Bay Mosque um, in Lagos, Nigeria, also known as like the Brazilian Mosque. Um, another I just want to speak very shortly about um, a really fascinating story about um, an enslaved Muslim scholar who traveled to Brazil um, and then traveled back to West Africa. Um, sorry, who, who, who traveled, who was transported to Brazil, then traveled back to West Africa to learn his religion, then went back to Brazil. So this particular man is known as Rufino Jose Maria or Jose Marie. He was a Yoruba Muslim cleric. Um, he was from Nigeria. So he was, he was from the Yoruba ethnic group. Um, he was enslaved in Brazil from a relatively young age, and in, in, sorry, he's enslaved in Nigeria. Then he was transported to Brazil. He actually grew up in a religious family. His father was an, an alufa or an afa, meaning a religious leader or a spiritual leader or a sheikh. Um, and when he was, he, he, when he was transported to Brazil, um, he was passed on to like about two or three different people who, who bought him. But what was, what, the way slavery was in, like in Brazil was that like, even though he was enslaved, he was still able to work um, and eventually, hopefully, buy your freedom. And he was known to be someone that was very industrious. Um, he worked as a cook. He worked as someone who also made amulets and sold that. So he was a very industrious person, a quite entrepreneurial person. And he eventually was able to purchase his freedom. And when he purchased his freedom, because he was working as a cook, and he was working as, as a cook on a, a, slave, um, a slave ship that went back and forth between Brazil and West Africa, that was obviously getting more slaves. And obviously, this was during the period when slavery was abolished. So when he purchased his freedom, he went back to West Africa, in, to Sierra Leone, in fact. Um, he, went to, he stayed there for a few years to learn more about his religion and further his religious knowledge. Then he went back to Brazil where he fathered a child um, and he was teaching people um, about, about Islam. And again, this is in the 19th century, which again, is, and this is a really fascinating book. It's in English now that's it's been translated. The story of Rufino, which again is definitely a really interesting read for anyone who's interested in learning or hearing more about his story. But this just kind of is an example of the industriousness and the um, the qualities of the of the West African Muslims that we don't really hear about um, and the great legacy that they've led. And when he was actually arrested twice, um, and one of the reasons why he was arrested was because remember I spoke about the slave revolts which took place in 1807, between 1807 and 1835, especially the slave revolt in 1835, and that led to widespread hysteria amongst the Brazilian authorities because they didn't want further uprisings. So anyone who, any like enslaved person or even free person who had anything that was Islamic, like in terms of any written text or an amulet with the Quran or anything like that, they were prosecuted or arrested because they feared that this person may be a, a potential rebel. And Rufino was one of these people. And whilst he was interrogated, wrongfully arrested, um, he, he was interrogated. They were asking him about his religion and why he was a Muslim and whether he should, you know, he should change his faith. And, he, and they found him. And this is, again, it's docu well documented in the police reports. 
they were very defiant um, because he had strong faith in his religion and he said that even if they gave him all of the wealth of this world he wouldn't renounce his faith and they respected him although although they noticed that they 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 found that he was very a defiant person and they spoke about his um, his intellectual demeanor as well as being very respectable even though he was very a proud uh, Muslim man and his arrest was reported in a number of Brazilian newspapers at that time in the 19th century and um, it was reported that he died in, in 1853 so I just wanted to kind of highlight the fascinating story of Rufino and this is like the 19th century that someone was able to you know not only buy his own freedom but travel back between South America and West Africa um, when there's no planes or anything about so it's just like a phenomenal and inspirational story um and because of the likes of Rufino and the the Malays the Malays who are the West African Muslims who led the number of slave revolts in recent times and like the last you could say 20 years there's been an, a growing Afro-Brazilian consciousness in Brazil not only to know about um the Malays but also about the Muslim presence and this has um, inspired a number of, like I said, Afro-Brazilian groups to kind of um, pay homage to the to to the Malays um, in in terms of their fight for e equality. And some of these groups are like the Posse Hausa. So this is like it's a hip hop group as well as a Afro-Brazilian civil rights group who, who speak about the rights of Black people in Brazil. And again, they a lot of them in, in their interview they speak about the um, the influence and the inspiration of of their of the ancestors of the of the the Malays and the Hausas who fought against enslavement in their fight for um, racial equality and for justice in contemporary Brazil. So this is like a couple of images of the of the Hausa of the Posse Hausa group. Um, some of them are Muslim, like this particular gentleman who's one of the leaders of the Posse Hausa. He's a Muslim, but a number of them are also not non-Muslim. And then this was a an exhibition about the Malays. Um, that was conducted um, for Muslims and non-Muslims in, in Brazil, which took place, I think, about 15 years ago. Um, and then again, uh, some other images of Afro-Brazilians and even like this particular gentleman who's not an Afro-Brazilian, but he also, he converted to Islam. He's based in Sao Paulo, Abdul Kabir, and he spoke about the impact of like the likes of Malcolm X and, and the Malays was one of the he's in, sparked his interest in Islam and um, convert eventually converting to Islam and also um, fighting um, oppression and, and speaking about the rights of, of black people and Muslims in Brazil and this particular and this gentleman is a is currently the imam of the only um, mosque in Salvador and he's of Yoruba descent um, and one of um, the organizers or the founders of that particular mosque because of the influence and the impact of the West African Muslims, they wanted to bring a, um, a West African imam to kind of lead the prayer and to become the imam there. So he's been the imam um, at that particular mosque for a number of years. And I was fortunate enough to, to you know, to meet him and interview him. And yeah, he, he's leading the, the multicultural Muslim community in, in Salvador. Um, so just wanted to show a couple of images. And this is an ex um, of, and then obviously you've got some two Muslim women here in, in, in Brazil. So, I think that brings an end to part two. Just, just, just went five minutes over time. Um, if I'll lead back to Professor Karen, if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you again um, for debunking a couple of myths, taking us back and forth from um, from Africa to Brazil and back, and uh, pointing us to people who actually uh, had a high degree of mobility. It was fascinating to see how. Um, it was possible in the 19th century for Rufino, for example, to go back and forth. But um, yeah, uh, I have uh, uh, Jennifer um, has a question and thanks you for the presentation. And she asks, do you know there was a large number of Muslim Africans who became enslaved in the United States? And do you know whether, if, if so, whether they were able to continue their practices even if in secret? Um, the reason I suppose uh, she came up with this question was that she has watched and recommend, would recommend the PBS documentary series, The Black Church, that highlights how very important the church has been and continues to be to enslaved and free blacks in the United States and to their sense of empowerment and hope. So um, the question was, do you know if there was a large number of Muslim Africans who became enslaved in the United States? Yes, there, there was. 
And there are a number of, and I can quickly show you that there's a number of um, resources that I recommend that there's more documentation and resources and documentaries about the enslaved um, Muslims in, in, um, in North America. Um, so again, some examples of, of books I would definitely recommend is Black Crescent, Servants of Allah, um, African Muslims in Antebellum America. So there are a number of books and there is a number of documentation of, of, of African Muslims that continue to practice their faith in, in America. Um, so yeah, there, and there's a lot of, like I said, um, and even, even for people who are familiar with the, um, the book and the drama series Roots that was written by Alex Haley, which is basically he's, it's a semi, semi-fictional tale of his ancestors dating back to um, Kunta Kente, the famous of Kunta Kente, who was his ancestor. Kunta Kente was a man from West Africa. He was a Muslim. And even in the, and it clearly shows, even if you read the book, or even if you've watched the drama series, whether it's the recent one or the one that came out in the 1970s, you see him um, reciting praise in Arabic, referring to God as Allah and things like that. So there are, there are many examples of um, African Muslims that were enslaved in the United States and continue to practice their faith um, in, in, in parts of the United States of America. And like I said, there are a number of um, documentaries and books um, about, I, I didn't really touch too much about the African Muslims in the United States because there's a number of fabulous um, historians and researchers who've spoken about, about that at length. Whereas with the Brazilians, like what many people, like many people, and it might be because of the English language, many people are familiar with the, um, the enslavement of black people in America, but not many people are aware that some historians report, report between four and 10 times the amount of black people that were transported to America were transported to Brazil. There were more black people that were transported to Brazil than, um, than, than the United States. And it's something that, again, a lot of people are surprised by because, again, we're, we're well aware of the black presence in America, but not many people are aware of the, of the black presence and the transatlantic slave trade, which existed in Brazil. And the way slavery was in Brazil, it wasn't, it wasn't the same as, as the United States. And what I mean by that is that even after slavery, and it was very common for black people to, inter, to intermarry and have relations with, um, with Brazilians. And even it was part of the Brazilian, um, elite what they wanted to do at their time at the time especially post-slavery is they had this idea they wanted to whiten the black race they and they had the a government um a government plan this is like they wanted they encouraged miscegenation because they thought that by black people and white people having relations eventually the black race will die out obviously that didn't happen but again it, it, the approach was very different to the united states approach with like jim crow and complete segregation so that's why even looking at brazil and race relations it's important to understand, and that's why I wanted to understand and appreciate how race and skin color and blackness is understood in Brazil, rather than looking at the United States model or even the UK model, because it's very different. So like I mentioned how blackness is viewed like descriptively, and it's not the same as maybe like the American model with the one drop rule, it's more fluid, shall we say. And even, even what constitutes a black person or Afro-Brazilian, it, it depends on what part of Brazil you, you visit and it, turn, it depends on how they self-identify. Whereas in, in, um, in, in the US, it's more, there's more conformity, I would say, in terms of how people view blackness and what constitutes a black person. Thank you for these insights. And I have to say, I was personally mesmerized by the links between uh, the Yoruba Muslims uh, originating from Nigeria and uh, the Himalayan Nico. Um, I thought this was, um, yeah, this was mesmerizing. It was also fascinating for me to learn more about the 1835 slave rebellion and also the visible traces in the pictures of the uh, African Muslims in Brazil um, of the 19th century. And then again, the Afro Brazilians in West Africa, um, those returnees. Um, I was, um, you said they were culturally different, okay. Uh, was that discernible um, somehow? And uh, would you be would you have been able to discern the different groups of returnees? And how would you be able to discern them? Yeah, very very good question. So, in in Brazil, so culturally, the Muslims were 
some yeah they were distinctively different in a sense of a their dress so both the men so the women tried to obviously maintain like the head covering so that's how you could probably they were more um distinguishable from non-muslims african um non non-muslim africans at the time and the men as well maybe like by the hat they, that they used to wear and they maybe tried to wear a long garb similar to how you can see like if anyone saw this picture you would think that this is in west africa but it's very distinctive in terms of like that was that's it's very common dress for of a muslim in, in in west africa so they tried to maintain um a certain distinctive dress and like i mentioned in terms of their um their habits or their practices so a number of them maybe didn't drink alcohol they will pray so there were no and this is something like i said that the brazilian authorities the police they mentioned in their works and that's why they were able to identify which of these africans were the so-called troublemakers like the muslims were known to be troublemakers because they were fighting for freedom and things like that now in, in, in regards to the second part of your question in terms of understanding the cultural differences of the um the afro-brazilian returnees in west africa the reason why again you, you'll be able to differentiate them from like you could say shall we let's call them the native shall we say is that some of them like i mentioned you might have had a nigerian muslim in brazil that's returning back to to sierra leone so culturally they're from a different ethnic group so that's one way that they, they might have known that this person is not really from like freetown in sierra leone they're from maybe lagos because culture they're from a different ethnic group where they speak a different language Facially as well, they may have a different phenotype as well. Um, and also the dialect and um, not so much maybe the, the dress, but more a case of the dialect, the language, and maybe, and, and the food as well was quite different. So even if you were to look at, for example, um, like, so this image, and this was one of the images that struck me, this is an image of an enslaved um, African in Brazil. Phenotypically, you can tell he's from, he's from the Yoruba ethnic group, or most Yorubas will be able to know. Like you could tell not only, not only by his features, but also by the, these facial um, scars. And this is something that was quite common up until maybe like 50 years ago that um, some, of it was, oops, sorry, some of it was for beautification purposes, some of it was known for, for tribal reasons. Some of it is tradition where men, even some women will have some, um, will have some in, indentions in their face. And, it, and some of them, and they mean different things, but just by again, looking at this per particular person's face, I could tell that this person is Yoruba. So even when I saw this image, and then I found out that this was taken in Brazil, it struck me because I think it looks like a family member, like one of my uncles, because it's very distinctive. Um, so that's like an example of where if, for example, this person was walking in, just say, Freetown, Sierra Leone, I'm sure that people probably would know that this person is not kind of like from here. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have, no, I wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> yeah, thank you for clarifying this. I would like to invite more questions from the audience. If you have any, please use the chat box or the f &A section. You're very welcome to ask questions or make comments. Congratulate the speaker on a, on a, on a great presentation, which some people have done already. Well said and high skilled presentation, high skilled person. If you have more questions, you're very welcome to ask them or make comments. Can we also invite questions for uh, part one as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, we can. Yes, of course, yeah. Happy to entertain any questions if people are still awake. <laughs> or some, that's, that's one of the challenges with history. It's, um, I wouldn't say it's a dead subject, but it's something, it's more, oh, fascinating, interesting, um, but it's always difficult to spark conversations or to get um, questions. Like when I do certain presentations, especially like about, um, I think m more people are kind of just interested. Oh, okay, like this is insightful. This is something I didn't know. Um, or people maybe want to know about maybe some connections with another area that maybe they're familiar with or they're passionate about. Uh, 
Um, but yeah, I can talk about this topic for hours, but I don't want to bore people. <laughs> I guess you can. can. Can I maybe ask a question? It's it's from from part one. With, it's a general question um, um, about your first book, um, but maybe also in general. Um, in um, in your book, the uh, male black male companions of the prophet, they clearly outnumber their female ones. Um, and uh, I guess you also answered why that was, obviously. But I would like to know which of them did you think was most inspiring in terms of female companions of the of the prophet? Which did which which is your favorite? Wow. Okay, that's a that's a great question. Not so no, no one's asked me that question, but that's a great question. Um, I would say Um Ayman and Baraka, who was a she was a she's the only person who knew the prophet muhammad from when he was born up until when he died and she was what she was the person that looked after him and he referred to her as his mother after my mother so his mother prophet muhammad's mother passed away when he was a relatively at a relatively young age amina and um Ayman, who was who belonged to um his parents she was an enslaved woman initially she helped raise him and like i said even when he became an adult the prophet peace be upon him also would refer to um Ayman. A, she was a black woman originally um, from east africa like modern day ethiopia eritrea um she he's always speak speak about her he used to honor her and um, like i said he used to refer to her as my mother after my mother um and even after her first husband passed away the prophet muhammad peace peace be upon him he advocated for someone to remarry her and he said to his other companions that if someone wants to marry a woman from the people of paradise, the people of Jannah, then they should marry um, Um Ayman because, like I said, she was a righteous um, and noble woman. And then one of his companions uh, married her and then they she gave birth to, to, to a child, which the prophet also took to that child like he was he, his son. So this was the woman that was obviously very, very close to, to him. Um, she was a woman who was, like I said, a righteous and um, courageous woman because she was also supporting the prophet when he was delivering his, his message. And even after the prophet so that died, um, his other close friends, his other two close friends, companions, used to even visit her. So Umar and Abu Bakr, who was the Muslim leaders who took over as a, the leader of the Muslims after the prophet died, they used to pay their respect to her and, and visit her after she died. So, yeah, if I was going to pick because there's so many inspirations behind her like I said when it comes to she was integral when in the story about the prophet advocating for a black woman to be married so that's why again that's, even that alone is important the way he honored her and spoke about her like you're my mother after my mother so this is the woman that hit the mother figure who raised him um yeah she, she would she yeah she, if I was going to pick one it'd definitely be um, Ayman, Baraka. so that's a great question I've not been asked that question before and I think there should be more, and unfortunately, not many people, Muslims included, know about her and her story. Um, and just touching on which you, you know, what you mentioned about, like majority of, like even the companions I mentioned were men. This is one of the tragedies, I would say, of, um, sorry, I don't want, I don't want my battery to, to die. This is one of the tragedies, I would say, of, um, of, not only Islamic history, but I think world history that we don't have more female stories or women's stories. Um, and I think there's several reasons behind that. Some of it is because maybe people do not want to, um, there's a lot of reasons behind that, but I just think, I think it's, it would both be inspiring both for men and women um, to be hearing more female stories and women's perspectives. So, um, but from Ayman, Baraka is definitely one woman that I think is a source of inspiration for men and women alike. But thank you for that question because I love that question actually. It's a great question. Thank you for answering it. Thank you. Now there is your last chance actually to <laughs> pose a question or make a comment in the chat box or in the FNA question section. I can see that. There are no more questions. Three, two, one, done. <laughs> <laughs> Hans, yeah, that was your last chance. So um, yeah, 
Thank you very much, um, Habib. Thank you very much for your fascinating contribution, for taking us on that journey um, and uh, for giving us these um, fascinating insights. Uh, thanks so much for being with us tonight. And uh, yeah, I'd like to hand over to Maria. Thank you very much, Professor Karin, for hosting this panel. This has been enlightening listening to Habib to like, speak about the perceptions of Black Muslims by other Muslims and African Muslims in Brazil. Thank you for, both for being here today. And also to our attendees, both old and new, many thanks for making the time to join us always. And then please join us for our next event on Wednesday the 13th of July at 6 p.m. for a splendid inaugural event of the African Heritage Festival, which is going to feature the history of Berbers of North Africa, the um, Nigerian festivals and some African music. So please join us. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye. Recording stopped.